is up you guys it's Dustin and I'm back with another true crime video in this video we're gonna be discussing a case that is actually from my hometown if you followed me for a long time you would know that I am from North Carolina this actually took place in Gaston County North Carolina where I was born where I grew up where I was raised and I very vividly remember the search for Jamie when she went missing now, I do have my own personal ties to this case because I did know Jamie a little bit I didn't know her very well I knew her in passing we had some of the same mutual friends and things like that but also one of the main people that is a suspect in her disappearance appearance also murdered my cousin Donna Miller. So I'm going to tell you guys all about this case, every bit of information that I have been able to find. And of course, I'm going to source everything that I'm going to use in this video in the description box as well if you guys would like to go over it and see exactly what it is that I pulled from to get this information. As always, I do request that you guys please be respectful of one another in the comments if you have a differing opinion from someone else. Also, be mindful that family members do watch these videos and people that were acquainted with Jamie and that knew her. So please be mindful of their emotions and their feelings when you leave comments about this very serious topic. Now, with all of that said, let's just jump into the case that is Jamie Michelle Fraley. I'm just going to start out by giving you guys the facts of the case, and then I'm going to go through the story and the timeline for you. So Jamie went missing around the 8th of April in 2008, so that has been a very long time. She is missing from Gastonia, North Carolina. She is considered missing and endangered, and she was 22 years old at the time that she disappeared. Jamie was somewhere between 4 foot 8 and 4 foot 10. She was between 90 and 100 pounds. So she was a very small girl. Jamie did have severe anxiety as well as bipolar disorder. So she was on a medication for this that she needed to take daily. It is speculated that she may not have been on her medication around the time that she disappeared just simply because she was very, very, very sick. And I'm going to give you guys the details about that here in just a moment. Jamie has blonde hair, blue eyes, and she does have the name Ricky tattooed on her right ankle. Jamie was described as being a very friendly person. She never really met a stranger. She was very kind hearted and cared a lot about her friends and her family and especially her fiance, Ricky Simmons Jr. From what I know of her and the few times that I met her in passing, she was just very friendly. And a lot of people have said that there wasn't even a mean bone in her body. Jamie's case has been on TV. It got a lot of news coverage here where I'm at, but it's most notably known because it was on Disappeared. And I feel like that got a lot of people talking about this case. And it started a whole bunch of theories about what could have happened to her. Now, Jamie didn't really have an easy life because she had bipolar disorder. She had really bad, severe anxiety. And when she was born, a lot of doctors didn't think that she was actually going to make it, but she pushed through, but it was very hard for her to get places that she needed to go because she couldn't get a license. So she depended heavily on her friends and family and even public transportation to get her to where she needed to be to go to her doctor's appointments and things. Now, Jamie really wanted to better her life and make something of herself and give back to the community. So she wanted to go to Gaston College and get a degree and become a substance abuse counselor. Now, I am from Gastonia. There is a lot of heavy drug usage in that area specifically. So I think that it's admired that she wanted to do this to help other people and she wasn't just thinking about herself. Now, leading up to her disappearance, she felt like her medications were helping her. She felt like she was really gonna meet the goals that she set for herself and wanting to get this degree. Now we're gonna get into the timeline of events. Now, this timeline is pretty well put together, but there's a lot that's missing and someone out there has to know what happened because this is just too mysterious. People just don't go missing for no reason. Now in 2006, Jamie moved into an apartment with her fiance, Ricky Simmons Jr., but he would eventually find himself in some legal trouble and he would end up being sentenced to 15 months in prison. That would start in early 2007. Now this didn't deter Jamie at all. She loved her man. She wanted to be by his side and there was never any thought of her leaving him or anything like that. And here's where everything gets twisted up and turned around and it just leaves a pit in my stomach because what I'm about to tell you is really, really scary. So Ricky Simmons Jr.'s father, Ricky Simmons Sr., lived in the same apartment complex as Jamie, two doors down from her. And he was also the maintenance person for this apartment complex that they lived in, which is very scary considering everything I'm about to tell you about this man. Someone like Ricky Simmons Sr. should have never been able to access people's apartments or anything like that because he was a danger to society. And let me tell you why. Back in 19 1986, Ricky Simmons Sr. actually murdered my cousin Donna Miller. He strangled her to death in her home. And I remember being a kid and I remember my parents and my aunt specifically because it was her daughter trying to fight this parole hearing because he was going to get out and it would come up every couple of years and they would fight it. But Ricky Simmons Sr. ended up actually getting out in 1992. Why that was ever possible, why that's a thing, North Carolina.
Carolina, you failed literally everybody involved, my cousin, my aunt, my entire family, because this man killed my cousin in cold blood, literally. But eventually, since Ricky Simmons Jr. was actually in prison, Ricky Simmons Sr. and Jamie became close friends because he only lived two doors down, and she didn't really have a way to get around to go visit her friends unless they'd come pick her up. So you can kind of see why there was actually some kind of friendship between the two. So on April 8, 2008, Jamie actually phoned her aunt, and she was like, you know, I don't really feel that well. I think I'm going to go to the hospital. I think I have a stomach bug, and for anybody that's had a stomach bug, you know just how bad that can be. You don't feel well. You're not really in the right frame of mind because your stomach hurts. You feel like you're going to puke, and it can be very overwhelming. So on April 8, 2008, Jamie called her aunt to let her know that she had actually been to the hospital, that she wasn't feeling well, that she had a stomach bug, and she let her aunt know that she was just going to chill out and that hopefully her symptoms would get better and she could just move on from this. So later that day on the 8th, Jamie was not feeling well. Her symptoms were not getting better. She just continued to get worse, and she decided that she actually needed to go back to the hospital for some care. So Ricky Simmons Sr. actually took her to the hospital and dropped her off so she could be seen for the stomach flu. So much like the hospital in the area that I grew up in Gaston County, Jamie realized that she was going to have a very long wait before she was able to be seen and she didn't really want to be there. She didn't want to be sick in the hospital, sitting there, just not feeling well. And she decided that she was going to go home. She tried calling Ricky back to see if he would come pick her up, but he didn't answer. So Jamie ended up having another friend of hers pick her up from the hospital and take her home. So around midnight on April 9th, 2008, neighbors of Jamie seen her go into her apartment for what would literally be the last time that anyone would see Jamie ever. Now, after going in her apartment, Jamie did actually call her mom to let her know everything that had happened, that she still wasn't feeling well, that she just needed to rest. Her mom actually wanted to pick her up, but Jamie was like, no, I have an appointment tomorrow that I have to get to. It's early in the morning, so I'm just going to go to bed. I'm going to rest. I'm going to take it easy for the rest of the night, and hopefully in the morning, she'll feel better. So the next morning rolls around and the public transportation person that Jamie has to pick her up and take her when she doesn't have friends or family available knocks on her door and they sit there for a while and they don't really get an answer. It is indicated in one of the articles that I found that the person did wait there for a, a pretty good amount of time before they left. So that whole entire day passes by. No one hears from Jamie. There's not even so much as a sign from her that she's okay. And her family by this time is pretty much worried about her because they know that she was sick. She wasn't really doing good with the stomach flu. But they waited to the 11th to check on her because by that time they knew that something was wrong. It was unlike Jamie not to call her mom and let her know what was going on with her day, how she was feeling, and giving her an update on what all had happened. So Jamie's mother actually calls in for a wellness check. Well, the cops get there and there's no signs of any kind of forced entry, no signs of foul play. There's literally nothing there, not even Jamie. So Jamie's family actually goes to her apartment. They rummage through it. They look to see if they could find anything that would indicate where she may be. And they found some pretty scary stuff. They found Jamie's entire purse as well as her keys. Now, I don't know anyone that really leaves home without at least a little bit of cash in their wallet. That's not something someone would typically do. And they also found a pair of Jamie's shoes that she wore frequently but the shoelaces were missing. So they found her house keys, her purse, as well as her shoes, but her cell phone was nowhere to be found. So at this point, Jamie's family is thinking, hey, you know what? Maybe she went to the hospital. Maybe she was just so sick that she just ran out with her cell phone and had someone take her to the hospital because it was very evident when they went through Jamie's apartment that she had actually been sick because there was like vomit all throughout her apartment. So Jamie's family actually went to the hospital to see if she was there and they had no record of her for being there the previous day at all. So throughout all of this, Jamie's family members are continuously calling her phone. That's what you do when someone's missing. You want to know where they're at, you call their phone. So they're calling her repeatedly. There's no answers. No one is picking up the phone. Jamie's not picking up the phone. They don't even know where the phone is at at this point. But someone actually eventually answers the phone, and it's a man. And he says that he found the phone on the side of the road and that he's a cable worker. He was working on some lines and that the phone was on the side of the road. Now, this is normally where I would get excited because this should offer some kind of information about what was going on, but the phone had been touched by so many people that they couldn't reliably get any kind of fingerprints or anything. And this was about three miles away from where Jamie lived at. The only bit of information that came out of the phone was a phone record from 1.30 a.m. in the morning where Jamie actually called her friend to let her know that she was gonna go back to the hospital and she only referred to the person that was taking her to the hospital as he. So no one knows who this mysterious he person is that was going to be taking Jamie to the hospital. So a little bit of time actually goes on 
And Ricky Simmons Sr. is actually interviewed by the police and they feel like he's being deceptive to them. But somehow, and I don't even know how this ties in, a bag of trash was found on the side of the road and they eventually linked it back to Ricky Simmons Sr. And they actually ended up getting a warrant to track him for this. So he was pretty much, in my opinion, the main suspect at the time. Given that he had already murdered my cousin and he lived two doors down from Jamie, it pretty much seems like a no-brainer, right? So eventually, a little bit more time goes by and Ricky Simmons Jr. is actually released from prison and he moves in with Jamie's family and they're all pretty much distraught because they miss Jamie and they want her brought home and they don't know what's going on with her. So he was in no way like at all ever a suspect in this case and I don't think he should have been either. So the police continue to investigate Ricky Simmons Sr. and eventually they find out that his ex-girlfriend Kim that actually did live with him two apartments down from Jamie ended up taking a restraining order out on Ricky on May 9th because she feared for her life. So on June 7th Kim is actually rolling around in her car and she's like something Something isn't right about this. She searches her car. She don't find anything. Her car smells funny. She doesn't know what's going on. She doesn't understand why her car would smell the way that it does. So she eventually gets around to looking in the trunk of her car and she finds Ricky Simmons Sr. in the trunk of the car dead because he had a heat stroke. Now under Ricky, there was some of Kim's personal artifacts as well as a knife. So a lot of people have speculated as well as the police, I believe, that he was actually going to try to assault Kim. Now it must be noted that there is nothing substantial that I've found that links anything of Ricky Simmons Sr. to Jamie's disappearance directly that has been shared with the public, but that does not mean that they don't know that he actually did have something in connection with Jamie going missing. But I personally believe in my whole heart that this man did this to this girl Jamie and took her away from her family. There's a lot of theories about this entire thing, but I don't think that those are really necessary. I truly believe in my heart of hearts that this man committed this crime against Jamie and took her away from her family. Gaston County is a very big area. There's lakes, there's rivers, there's mountains, there's all kinds of places where Ricky could have hid Jamie's body. And hopefully one day, I hope that her family does get closure. And honestly, I hope Ricky Simmons Sr. is rotting somewhere in hell where he deserves. He got his karma for what he did to my cousin, but he did not get his karma for what I believe that he actually did to Jamie. If you know anything about this case, if you know any bit of information, you are urged to call Gaston County Police Department at 704-866-3320. Someone out there knows something. Someone out there knows what happened. Someone out there is privy to some little bit of information that could solve this case for this family and give them the closure that they deserve. But you guys, this is the case of Jamie Fraley. I hope I did her justice. I hope you guys can make sense of everything that I said in this video. And I truly do hope with my whole heart that Jamie's family does get the closure that they deserve out of this one day and that Jamie is found. But please let me know your thoughts about all of this down below. Again, please keep it respectful. And until next time, I hope you all have an amazing day and I will see you in the next video. Bye guys. <laughs>